There we go. So this is the OGM check-in call on Thursday, March 17th, 2022. Um, yeah, Eric, so two years ago at um, Unfinished 2020, uh, and Unfinished is a conference I've never attended in person, but it, it's been held in like a castle in Bucharest. It, it, they, they apparently have a beautiful venue that they've used over and over again. And then when pandemic, they went virtual and they invited me to give a keynote in 2020, which I did and, and loved. Um, and then in the run up to that, I mentioned the story threading idea and they were like, oh, we can't do that now, but hold that thought. So when they were planning on finish 2021, they said, hey, Jerry, uh, would you like to try this out? And so they invited also uh, uh, a woman named Emma Schmidt who came in and story threaded with me. She's a graphic illustrator. And so she would make a, a drawing of the sessions that we story threaded and I did my brain and commentary sort of thing. Um, and it worked really well. So we did six sessions, uh, each of which are interviews, like complete interviews, you know. So, so without watching the interviews, just watching our story threading doesn't make that much sense, right? It doesn't, it doesn't all kind of come together. Um, but, but I really like the, the assembly. I like, I like how they work. And, and so then they edited um, a picture of Emma's illustration, the interview, my story threading, and then a picture of Emma's illustration at the end. And that, that sort of bookending a session. Um, and then there's links to my brain and whatever else. And I don't know, did you have a chance to peek at any of them or? Uh, I watched the one with Emma. That was uh -huh. interesting. Um, but what you just said, editing, that that's really important. Uh, just getting the right clips in the right order to present uh, your case or whatever you're talking about. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And one of the things I don't, I haven't gone back and looked at the, the videos on YouTube, but one of the things that, one of the problems with this, the, the, the organization I just mentioned is that it's really hard to figure out where the story threading starts. And there's a very simple low tech solution, which is chapters on YouTube. Do you know how to do chapters? I've seen it. I haven't played with it. It's super simple and really impressive. It's like, yep. huh, in the description field that you, you as the poster have full control over. So in the description field, just, just do zero colon zero zero intro. And that means that timestamp zero zero okay. zero just put the word intro on the timeline, right? And then you put timestamps and whatever word you want to show up on the timeline. And it just it it just has to be any place in your description. And Zoom is smart enough to find it and then add those little tabs to your video. Oh, nice. And it makes your video completely scannable, much more easily scannable. It reminds people of what's what's happening in the session. It's like a brilliant feature. I don't know, I don't know why more people use it. Yeah, it's, it's it should be like a must must use kind of thing. Um, and I wish, for example, that there was a way, it'd be really fun if there was a way during our calls where as we shifted sort of topics a little bit in retrospect, but sometimes you can tell, well, we talked about this for a while, you know, we talked about unfinished for a while, and then we shifted into the call format, and then this is who was speaking for a while, and then this, that if we had like annotations like that, we could kind of assemble that ourselves. Um, in fact, a, a, an interesting thing we might do even for this call is to set up a, in the chat um, we could even we could even maybe do it in the chat so that I could search search through the chat and find the the timestamps and the topics exactly, um, and do that, Mr. Friend. Good morning. Yeah, we're all unfinished. We were talking Doc, about unfinished. Dr. Mikowski, how are you, sir? Exactly. I am well, thank you. We're being we're being formal this morning. Okay, I've yes. I've, I've I've seen some folks that are doing long courses um, on YouTube. Uh, just periodically stop the recording at breakpoints. Just turn, toggle the recording off and on, which produces a timeline that shows breaks in it under the YouTube screen, and they provide an annotation, uh, you know, like kind of a time catalog in the notes. Interesting. You know, at, so three, at 308, we did this, and at 704, you know, seven minutes, four seconds, we did this. So that, that's one way to do it that I've seen that what seems does you, to work. And so that works when you stop and start in Zoom, and that turns into something interesting on YouTube? I believe so. Because I'm not sure how that translates. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. I've, I've seen people say, I'm stopping and starting to give you marks, and in the video I'm looking at, I'm seeing, I'm seeing marks, you know, breaks in the, in the stream. And then a time, and then a, then a man, I guess a manually annotated time code that goes below that explains what's happening when. Right, so right. something to check. Thank you, thank you. Hi everybody, H happy St. Patrick's Day. Everybody wearing green. This is Nobody is. 
<laughs> Nobody else. Hat, I'm in green. I'm in, this is hat, nominally green. Quasi hat, green. Yeah, it's, it's hat, happy, green. happy poor. Happy Purim also. There's probably several others. Yeah, exactly. Happy day of whiteboard racing. I don't know. There's all. There's a day for for everything, right? Um, a potato chip day. I heard it was potato chip day. Maybe it was yesterday. I don't know. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Does that I, mean we're supposed to eat more of them or honor them by not eating them? Eat more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, a couple of weeks ago it was uh, uh, ladder safety day. <laughs> Which you would think, what what is that? Something Wonder Day? An everyday be ladder safety yeah. day. Yeah. For Purim, uh, it's Esther the Wonder Pig. Esther the Wonder Pig. <laughs> Yeah, from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow missed Esther the Wonder Pig. Gonna have to look her up. Uh, cool. Let let us go into our um, our reverie of uh, of check in format. And why don't we go, uh, Doug Stewart, Stacy? Okay. Um... I've never gone first. I, that's you know what I was I was looking at you going you know you're always you always somehow end up at the tail end you should go first. So uh, probably the middle would be better, but I'll do this. And you like reflecting on what everybody's been doing, but I'm not giving you that chance right. this time. Well, <laughs> what's you could also on pass, mind. and I could defer you in you know in, into later, but yeah, no, this is fine. Okay, what's good. been on my mind is thinking about uh, Elon Musk's approach to getting to Mars. Okay. And it goes like this. I'm not interested in going to Mars. I think it's a mistake. But his approach to going to Mars, I really like, which is to be fearless about what it's going to actually take and then organizing to do it. Uh, and he's extremely good at that kind of project management. So my view is, what if the goal was to colonize Earth, not to colonize Mars? And what is it going to take? What do we need to do to feed everybody? What do we need to do to house everybody? How do we stop the burning of fossil fuels? Uh, I'm totally convinced that it requires a multipolar world of leaders who uh, are willing to work in friendship with each other and that a monopolar world doesn't work because it always goes to authoritarian. Uh, and we just need to be forthright about putting it all together. Uh, and it's just damn hard. Uh, we don't have the leverage points. Uh, I thought, for example, what if we deputized all the teachers in the world to be re the local representatives of this process? Anyway, that's what I've been thinking. Um, so my shorthand for what you just said is, what would Elon do? Um, WWED. And, and I would love for you to riff a little bit more. He does appear to be fearless and he's flirted with bankruptcy many times. I don't know if he's declared bankruptcy ever or, or whatever. I know, what would Bucky do? You know, so many people are traveling on, on Bucky's thinking these days, it's, it's lovely. Like he had a, he's had a, a huge long effect on the world in, in trying to rethink the world. Um, but how does this work? Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, well, <clears throat> Bucky's proposal for World Game was very much what Doug is talking about. Um, and yeah, let's do that. Uh, the multipolar world and unipolar world is a funny thing. Um, Alexander Dugin, who is, uh, you know, arguably Putin's main strategic advisor, uh, talks very compellingly and terrifyingly about a multipolar world. It doesn't sound very democratic at all, but um, uh, unipolar certainly got its problems. There's um, an interview uh, I don't know how many of you follow uh, Lex Fridman, who's doing amazing interviews. And he did uh, uh, Musk and uh, Zuckerberg in the same week. Wow. Uh, and he's really a tough interviewer. And he has a three hour interview with Musk, mm -hmm. where Musk really lays out the details of what it takes to put together a project to get to Mars. And he does not back away from the details. As soon as something looks like a problem, he moves right into it uh, with the requisite talent uh, to solve yep. the problem. Yep. And that interview is really worthwhile. And uh, he's an amazing guy we should talk about sometime, Lex Fridman. And uh, it's spelled the way I put it in the chat, Doug? F-R-I, 
rather than E, F R I D M A N. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if, if somebody could find a link for that, that would be great. There's also an interview with him and um, not an interview, but uh, um, <clears throat> Chris Anderson did a piece in Fortune, I think early 18, maybe early 17, early 18, profiling Musk and Jobs. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. The thing that stood out, you know, each of them as people who had reinvented four industries, which is pretty stunning in itself. And the thing that stood out for me was uh, the discussion of the launch of SpaceX and apparently he had his team look at what are the, the physical limits uh, of putting um, a payload into orbit. Um, figuring that there is some gap between NASA's 1950s, early 60s rocket technology and what we can do today, there might be some opportunity there. And he figured if it was like a 2x, there could be a play. It turned out to be a 100x differential. And on the spot, he wrote a check for him $100 million, as the story goes. Just saying, you know, if there's a gap, let's go in it. Uh, and so it, 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 I, I found it you know, stunningly fascinating at the courage of that. And then the, 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 the compliment that Doug's talking about of the willingness to go from that huge picture perspective down to the nuts and bolts of what does it take to do it is it seems pretty rare and yeah, very much worth paying more attention to. Um, Along with it is, uh, I mean, the world is divided into those who basically want to keep the current economy going, but with new energy, but no social change. The alternative view is the social institutions have to really change. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just forget uh, about industrial civilization and move into a garden civilization that we have a chance of being able to run uh, and feed everybody and house everybody. And, and I see Doug, a guy in the middle of my screen who's fascinated by that idea. Um, and Doug, uh, I, go ahead, Phil. I'm sorry, can, can I just follow up on that here? Yeah. Um, so I, I love Doug that you said, so we, let's just move from an industrial civilization to a garden world civilization. And I'm contrasting that, what you, what you said before about Musk being willing to dive into all the nitty details of what does it take to put, to build a civilization on Mars. So uh, in the gap that you just <clears throat> posted for us, I'd love to hear you dive in and talk about what does that transition strategy look like? Because social change ain't engineering. <coughs> Well, I think two key points is, first of all, to cut CO2, we've got to cut the use of, of fossil fuels, which is going to unemploy a lot of people. So I think really? the, the two thrusts are cutting fossil fuels and building a, a new kind of welfare society to take care of all the people who are hurt by the process. And that's about as far as I've gone in my thinking. If I if I may, please class. I just had a conversation with someone else about overshoot. <clears throat> so so we the the generally accepted number of overshoot is one point seven, meaning we're using one point seven times the regenerative capacity of the planet. When you look at aquifers being overdrawn, fish stocks at uh, fished out way beyond their regeneration rate, minerals and so on and so on. So you take today we're about like 7.8, 7 7.9 billion people roughly. You divide that by 1.7, you come up with around 4.5 billion people. That would be the carrying capacity of the planet given today's inequalities, right? There's still hundreds of millions of people, food insecure and what have you. <clears throat> but, but we are still adding roughly 80 million people per year net. So. So by, um, by 2030, we are on track to reach 8.6 billion people. So the quest, which is clearly not going to happen, and, and we, the choice we have is over um, figuring out how to not have it happen. It can happen, it can be avoided by wars and famines and chaos, or we can have um, uh, a somewhat organized way of, of shifting direction and the, the chances of shifting directions, quite frankly, just don't look really very good. But that's basically the scenario that we, we are, when you look at this from a bank account perspective, you know, we have a bank, we have a capital in the bank that draws X amount of interest, but we're spending beyond it. But then every year we want to draw more out of the bank account. 
because we are drawing down the ecological capital of the planet while we're increasing our demand on it. It looks pretty bad. <clears throat> Thanks, Klaus. Um, Doug, I like, I have a, I, I'm, I'm impressed by Musk's uh, ability to reimagine and successfully rebuild things and like, wow, okay. Uh, you know, who, who is the biggest passenger automaker in the US, et cetera, et cetera. That's like crazy stuff. And uh, troubled by his, his uh, a lot of his personal stuff, but really troubled by his and Bezos and others, uh, we have to get off this rock philosophy. And I like how you're bending, I like how you're repurposing Musk's about getting things done-ness back, back to earth uh, and focusing on us. But then I'm a little surprised that your first move is a negative move. Your first move is we must cut carbon emissions. And, and I'm like, wow, there's so many positive things to do. And like, hmm, first thing is cut carbon emissions, which is going to unemploy a lot of people. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What happened to everything else? And can't we, isn't, isn't greening the most incredible em employment opportunity around? And like, there's a whole bunch of other arguments here. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised by your logics there. Well, notice I'm putting cutting fossil fuels and the new welfare state in parallel in time. They're not sequential. I know, but the new welfare state doesn't fix that much. No, okay, no, so not to the answer about greening. The problem with greening right now is it's so caught up in greenwashing and weird ways of making a profit off of everybody by pretending to be green. And if you look at specific projects like the growing trees, uh, it doesn't add up very well. There's a lot of critiques of what's wrong with those things. I don't think that we should stop uh, green projects that look like they fit this tough scenario. Uh, but I don't think that the basic uh, social language right now of going green uh, cuts it. Um, anybody else? Cool. Let's, um, let's go back to our queue, which is Stuart, Stacy, Mark. Uh, yeah. So the previous conversation, just tease up uh, some of what I'm, I'm, I'm feeling right now. And that is um, human, uh, human ability to be uh, carping with ideas as opposed to collaborating. And I'll just, uh, you know, um, I'll tie that into just watching the incredible level of inhumanity going on in Ukraine today. Um, it's just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking to watch this uh, incredible level of destruction. And so at the root of, of, of all of this, of any grand plan is the idea of changing human beings' psyche, changing the way we think. Um, there'll always be some marginal level of criminality, I think, um, <clears throat> where, where, you know, people are just not housebroken and don't have the capacity to live in society. But all of us need to make a, a, a leap in some way so that we can actually work together. Um, and, and listening to the conversation, the idea of a grand plan, um, because of the carping nature that we seem to have, uh, I, I, it almost seems like an impossibility. Um, what seems more likely is that we um, go back to an older way of organizing, almost like a hunter-gatherer, hunter where you've got small groups of people um, creating the conditions that work effectively. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little stymied right now um, because this, the, the level of, of, um, of sadness just in these last few days, um, the cumulative effect of three weeks of, of, of of bombs and projectiles and explosions and kids being killed. Uh, I'm just finding it a little bit overwhelming at this moment. Yeah, thank you, me too. And, and the idea that this might just be the start of a protracted thing like this, because Russia, Russia turned Grozny into rubble, Aleppo into rubble, like, like Russia knows how to do this and has no particular compunctions about doing it. Um, and so here we are with, with everybody holding a smartphone and having a still a cell connection miraculously. So we're getting like reporting from everywhere. It's very but, for some, but for some reason, <clears throat> it doesn't look like they're applying the Grozny strategy. 
in Ukraine. At this point, at this point not yet. I mean, because I, don't I mean, the, 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 new, guns. the news reports keep talking about utter devastation in Ukrainian cities, but it looks like much less than that for now, given given what they did in Grozny. Um, so Grozny took a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You keep, and, and, and also, I think they were carpet bombing, like like only two just, weeks. Yeah. In. yeah. Yeah, yeah well, sir, they're not they're not carpet bombing in Ukraine at this point. Right. Yeah, I think you for, can't, for whatever reason. Yeah, I don't think you can tell from the media how much destruction is actually going on because they tend to play things on a on a loop on a yeah. reel. Um, but it was you, you know, but there's enough of it that that um, at least from the the um, the news the the piece that they that uh, Zelensky put together for his presentation to Congress. Um, there's enough destruction that, you know, they've taken some beautiful cities and just um, made messes out of them. Between that and the, and the, um, the preparations for uh, a Russian invasion, um, you know, how long does this take to, to, to put back into place, uh, you, you know, uh, when, whenever the, the continuation um, ends? Yeah. Um, let me tug you back to the waters of grand schemes may not work. What we what you see is sort of tribalization or small scale solutions collaborating. I think there's a I think that's that's kind of the problem of our times is that we're facing hyper objects. We're place, we're, we're facing wicked problems, very thorny thorny uh, messes that are endangering humanity. And unless we work against each other as little as possible, we're probably not going to figure out how to solve those things. And we may just, we may just through crisis wind up as tribal, uh, you know, with way less population as tribes that are basically, you know, figuring out how, how to live. And, and I have this uh, hopefully increasingly popular view given uh, Graeber and Wengro's book uh, and so forth that long ago, we used to really understand hunter gatherer. We think of hunter gatherers as like starving and warlike when in fact they were pretty much fat and happy and, and working very little to, to feed themselves because the landscapes were plush with food. We hadn't destroyed all the, all mm -hmm. the landscapes yet. Uh, and, um, and, and they had hard won knowledge for how to collaborate with the landscape. They didn't divide the landscape up into plots where that's your apple orchard, this is my, my cow pasture. Um, they actually worked together to sort of say, hey, let's do this, let's make complementarities, let's, let's craft and sculpt the landscape actively. So, so uh, in, in his book, 1491, Charles Mann talks about how uh, probably two thirds of the North and South American landmass appear to have been actively managed by humans with no fences and no anything else. But, but you, can, you can go into the Brazilian rainforest, which we think of as pristine jungle, and you can drop core samples in the earth and you'll find terra preta, which is prepared earth, which is broken up pieces of clay pottery. Somebody made a million pots at a juncture of rivers in the middle of the Amazon, which we think of as like Amazon. Somebody made a million clay pots, broke them up and folded them into the earth with human uh, detritus to, to, to make, make the soil really fertile surprisingly fertile. And we're just discovering those kinds of things. Like, whoa, what? And so, so there's, there's like multiple degrees of this that we've understood how to do before and we've wiped out most of that knowledge. So unfortunately, if we were driven back to tribal nature right now, we might in fact be pretty stupid. We, we might've lost much of, much of what that was. Sorry, Doug, you've been, you've been wanting to jump in for a bit. Well, I think going along with going tribal and local is a really good use of the internet to share knowledge across villages. And the problem with looking at going local only is too many places in the world are not capable of, of sustainable agriculture. Uh, and so we've, we've got to figure out how to help those people by integrating them into a network, even if the focus is local. And, and I'm really interested in the combination of old and new in lots of different ways. And I'm in agriculture, for example, um, you know, we've been talking a lot in these calls about regenerative agriculture, Klaus is on fire and on a great mission to, to make sure that more of that happens. There's also um, uh, agroforestry and vertical farming and a bunch of sort of aquaponic, hydroponic, otherponic kind of things that where people are saying, well, we don't need garages in downtown areas because, you know, uh, auto, because autonomous vehicles are going to like take them away. We could turn them into farms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
and and to me that that's like a high tech low tech way of maybe conquering some of these things and then behind the scenes of course there's all these habit things like we eat a lot of beef which is like the wrong way to use uh, the planet in 15 different ways um but we need to figure out how to blend well what these things are right right <laughs> Uh, Gil, you want to go yeah, ahead? It's, class, go ahead. Yeah, when you when you consider that we are exporting the way we grow food and the way we screw up nature here all over the world, you know, when, when you look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, Arabs now buying land in Tanzania, you know, to then transfer, to take huge tracts of land and put that into industrial production, you know, screwing up their topsoil and water and what have you. That uh, that's we have to convince these 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 uh, uh, multinationals you know, to shift direction in so far in the food industry that is as hard to to come by as it is in the energy sector. I just got surprisingly uh, accepted as a speaker to an international conference in Croatia <clears throat> that is addressing the processed food industry. And it's just this just came out uh, cool. uh, where they make it official that uh, indeed, because I put forth an abstract that was pretty radical, saying that uh, the processed food industry has to shift direction and accommodate the needs of the farmer to change into regenerative practices, which means they need to change out their types of crops, their crop cycles, which means the industry has to decentralize its supply chain. So I, I thought I'll never hear from them again. And here they uh, not just accepted it, but uh, make an announcement out of it. So, so there is the, the, the we, we need to reach out you know, to countries in Africa, in, in Asia, uh, to, to in South America to assist them in understanding what is being done to them because the, these, these companies go into Tanzania, pay off the political leadership, and then do things that are just devastating uh, and perpetuating this, this, this madness. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. No, thank you. Um, well, let's go back to our queue. Uh, Stacy, Mark, Michael. Oh, so, yeah, I mean, I could talk about like what Stu brought up but I don't want to because what Doug brought up is something that I've been dreaming about for a long time to have the kind of calls where we start at the beginning knowing that, well, this needs to be done, but if we do that, what would be the downside and how do we catch that? So, you know, doing those two things together. And I guess what, what I find is in our culture is sort of a stunting of imagination. Um, yeah. you know, I, I'm gonna leave it at that because I just have too many things going on. But Doug, I really wish that you would have a call with only the people that wanted to play that if then, then what? Because too often in collaborating, we try to get everybody on the same road and it would just be better if we just split off for a little bit. And then those that find an interest find their way back. And, and I'm extremely interested in our processing, composting, mulching, weaving, what each of these ideas does and is in back into the middle so that we keep sort of uh, figuring out um, okay, that, that group over there sorted out a couple really wise answers. Let's fold those into the mix of the collective wise answers. And, uh, and we're, not, we're not doing that very well as a, as a culture or even as, as small subgroups. What's happening is there are communities that have grown up um, like Donut Economics at this point. And Kevin is now pretty heavily in, involved in Donut. Uh, Donut has a structure, a model, a book, a leader, and there's a bunch of communities around the world who are trying to practice you know, donut economics, which is really interesting. Um, what can we carry out of donut economics and into this common pool of good ideas and remix with game B and with you know, whoever else? Go ahead, Stacey. If I could, since Elon Musk was brought up, um, on another call, somebody was talking about how you know, he open sourced all of his stuff and now companies in China are his biggest competitor. 
And I pointed out that that's really in his best interest because all that demand is going to increase the push for infrastructure here that will support his company. So it's that kind of thinking, you know, that um, I think is important. Agreed. And I don't think he open sourced all his stuff. He open sourced some battery technology that was really important because he wanted he wanted the batteries to be ubiquitous and cheap, as you just said. Uh, it drove stuff. But there's a bunch of Elon stuff that's very proprietary. I mentioned uh, terms of batteries. Should have been clear. Sorry. Um, Gil. I, I, I had thought he open sourced all his stuff, but um, um, no matter. I mean, he, he seems to be less concerned about making more money than about transforming the mobility industry on the planet. He knows he'll make money doing that. Um, but you know, his goal was not for Tesla to be the biggest car company in the world, but for the com for the car industry to go EV. And he's succeeding at that. It's one of the you know one of the industries that he's transformed. Uh, I, I like this mix, and I like what Stacy said, and would would love to do that conversation. And I would invite Doug to role play Elon Musk. Uh, take the take the idea that you Doug put Musk. forward. Take the idea that you put forward about the mission, what Sally Ride called the mission to planet Earth, and speak as though you were Elon with that perspective and drive and focus and so forth. Not like a bunch of people thinking, Would it, wouldn't it be nice if, but if you were that, and it's not just the, it's not just that you could write a hundred million dollar check. That's not the most important thing about him. The most important thing, as several people have said, is the way he approaches a complex project. Uh, so, I would love to have that conversation with you and Stacy and anybody else that would want to do that. You know, as in, as in, what if we could actually make this happen? What would we do? Love that. That's a little bit why tongue in cheek I posted. What would Elon do at the top of the of the chat? It's like, well, it's like, what would I do if I was able to think like Elon? Right. Right. The other thing here to, to what several people have said about the planetary deficit, I think Klaus, you were the clearest about it. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a Congress that is filled with deficit hawks that are in the way of all kinds of shit because of their obsession with financial deficits. What if we could turn the deficit hawks onto the planetary deficit? What if we could bring their fierceness to the planetary deficit or bring that consciousness into their minds about a deficit to pay attention to? And uh, Eric put in the chat a little bit earlier that in, in IT, there's this idea of a technological deficit where, man, we forgot to write the documentation back there and there were a couple bugs and those things basically add up and you then have to pay your, it, sorry, technological debt. Um, and you, you have to sort of pay the piper later on because those things accrue. Uh, let's go Stuart then Klaus. Yeah, uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, one of the reasons that I think that, that we're not as creative as we might be is that we're all uh, just so busy. Uh, we are we're, we're living in a culture of incredible busy busyness, and so the creative ideas just don't don't um, you know percolate uh, percolate up up and out. And um, you know maybe Elon Musk does it uh, because he smokes a lot of grass. <laughs> That's just that 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 may be his 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 secret. I don't I don't I don't really know. Um, I love the idea of, of you know smaller groups you know really drilling down on a on a good central core of an idea. Um, Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Klaus, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to, to uh, challenge Gil's thought that the congressional members are deficit hawks. They're not. They're, no, they, they used are to be prostitutes. They're prostitutes. Uh, I was listening to. Uh, uh, a hearing on the uh, Congressional Agricultural Committee yesterday, uh, focusing the in link between farm bill and climate change. And every single Republican had something incredibly negative to say about, you know, why are we uh, not increasing with biofuel mandates? Why are we not, uh, you know, why are we messing around with our incredibly successful agricultural system and so on? They are defending status quo because that's where their money is. They, they, they don't have any uh, uh, noble intentions to control the deficit. Now, on the contrary, when you think about how, how uh, they were spending money during the Trump administration, it was ridiculous. So that's really the unfortunate thing is they're just bought out. Uh, you forgot the air quotes, Gil? 
I, I forgot the air quotes. I mean, if you if, if you look at the chart over the last I don't know, 40 or 50 years, the federal deficit always goes up under Republican administrations, goes down under Democrat administrations. So yes, it's a bullshit phrase. And still, I think there's something in the idea of focusing people on the planetary deficit. Cool. Um, let's go back to our queue. Mark Michael Ingrid. Um, thanks. Good morning. Um, just got back in town from a funeral of the last aunt oh. of, uh, of 10, uh, uh, sir, um, 10 uh, aunts that had aunts and uncles that had children. And uh, um, uh, heck of a lot of Mexican food. Total, <laughs> total, total Mexican family with doctors to cholos, just uh, you know, low riders and uh, um, epidemiologists and gastroenterologists and you know what city was it in? Um, Oxnard and Moore Park. Um, uh, there's uh, the big family burial plot in uh, Oxnard, but uh, Moore Park was uh, the funeral and and uh, where kind of the center of the family was. They've been around for uh, for many many years, and uh, Moore Park grew up around them. Um, and uh, yeah, that was interesting, you know, to get back and to uh, um, you know get into the work, which is too busy, and there's many things to too many things to uh, to do. Um, there's one thing that I want to be very creative on at work. Um, basically, going in a different direction than than some of the people, and I just don't have time. So I'm going to let it go in the wrong direction, and, you know, just, just get my work done um, and hopefully uh, come back to that. Um, walking home, um, you know, I'm always thinking about, uh, well, at, 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 actually, uh, um, at work, uh, somebody showed up, rang the doorbell to do a book donation, and it turned out to be uh, one of the people from Abalone Alliance. Um, the big uh, uh, like Mission and uh, 16th and Cap Street uh, brick building that is a, was a center for uh, nonprofits is is pricing people out, and so Abalone Alliance is closing their offices, and uh, and we had an incredible conversation because I have been focused on uh, the notion of training. Um, as uh, Doug Engelbart um, mentions, you know, human systems. Uh, training is essential. And so we've been having a number of, of different uh, conversations at work. And some people are going, yeah, we don't need training. We're good enough. And I'm like, oh, no. And so we talked about the Quaker. Um, he called it the monster manual of how to do um consensus dialogue and um the idiot manual it's like i guess the idiot's guide to consensus dialogue and uh decision making um and uh so you know a couple different resources from him um because that was as an activist what worked for uh the protest at diablo canyon and all the affinity groups um all over the planet, all of the country um, were trained, um, self-trained in consensus process. And when we got together at the outside the uh, power plant and I think it was 82, um, things went swimmingly in terms of how people uh, organized um, kind of, don't want to use the term spontaneously, but, but they they had skills of how to respect and talk with each other they had training they had experience um oddly enough walking home from work um i live in the inner sunset and there's a bookstore green apple on the park and they have a lot of uh, author talks and talking was monica guzman uh, who wrote a book i never thought of it that way interviewed by buster benton a book why are we yelling and um, a group, uh, Braver Angels, um, basically um, having small conversations uh, between Republicans and Democrats, um, uh, uh, focusing on 
skills of communicating and listening, um, depolarizing conversations and stressing the importance of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, breakouts to basically have people uh, develop a natural curiosity for each other um, above and beyond, you know, the polarizing media. And, you know, she's a journalist and, you know, they had this little hold America together um, refrigerator magnet. Um, and uh, it was fascinating. And uh, I haven't looked at any of her YouTubes, uh, uh, but they're you know, all over the place. And uh, it was a fascinating conversation. And I certainly asked the question about, you know, what is the role of training and how do we get people to basically train? I mean, here we are, 13 people. Do we do our best in um, listening and, you know, uh, story threading in this particular uh, manner? Um, you know, I was reflecting that I so miss um, Kiko Lab, and there was a difference in conversation and a difference in connection there that I don't get in these OGN calls. I'm kind of wondering, huh, how can I um, you know, participate in, you know, the imaginative redesign uh, and play to experiment in different ways of connection that I've experienced, but not all the time. Um, and so that's where I'm at. I continue to work on uh, my MX, you know, Mexican mind model of association, where um, you know, relation is not as important as, mm, well, a specified relation is not as important as um, the exploration of relation, of possible relation between um, terms within the language. Um, and boy, can I not really um, explain it very well, but that's, that's a struggle. And so I, I continue to uh, um, really play at uh, um, trying to build a real person-centered open global mind. And, um, you know, that's the main reason I'm here um, is the research in semiotics and in thinking and imagination and trying to basically create a tool that is lifelong for everyone um, to have their own secure, um, never shared with anybody else, mind tool to basically reflect on their own uh, processes of thinking and knowing. Um, yeah. Um, I completely fail at it since 1984, but try, try, try again. Um, and I'm happy to listen here. And um, uh, it just seems like sustainable agriculture has been all over the place, but unsustainable demand um, might be uh, uh, not going to allow that in those places um, that, you know, uh, sustainable agriculture could work at a smaller scale. Um, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Mark, thank you for the really, really rich check-in. I was just, you put so many things on the table in a lovely way. Um, we should talk more about Braver Angels at some point. It's super interesting. It's clearly a, a, a sort of sibling community to what we're doing that's done a lot of work, a lot of really fantastic work. Uh, they're trying hard to bridge the cultural divide by using actually respect, friendship, trust, a bunch of pretty basic human traits that seem to work pretty well when you sit down and slow down and actually try to do them. It's quite interesting. Um, and then so many other things. I mean, uh, one piece of what may, made Kiko Lab work really well was them just really experimenting with formats and doing a lot of playful things. Another is them diving wholeheartedly into giving each other praise and saying, hey, here's what everybody's qualities are and what goes on. There's a lot of good things, uh, good things there. And I, I miss Charles and Lauren being uh, in the conversations. That praising was interesting, uncomfortable, insightful, weird. Um, 
it, it really well was, put. was not something that I was comfortable on at first. Um, and, uh, um, you know, hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we have, we are creative humans. We have uh, a lifetime to play. And, um, you know, I appreciate that spirit. Thanks. Uh, Stuart? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what Mark was, was saying about training. Um, I might have added to my, 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 my own check-in. And uh, last week I did a three-day uh, training as an instructor um, in Houston, uh, how to lead with emotional intelligence. Um, and what goes on is, you know, in most organizations, you know, they, they want you to uh, uh, teach for an hour or two <laughs> and nothing happens. You raise ideas. <clears throat> but if I get to work, and it's one of the reasons I do these programs on behalf of the Amer American Management Association, if I can work with a group for three days, I know that the human beings will not be the same uh, at the end of three days as they were when they began. And there's an incredible hunger um, for that kind of connection and that kind of real um, conversation. So we have the capacity to do it. It's just like with so many uh, other things, do we have the, the will to make this happen? Um, I've always thought of um, the huge potential that all kinds of large business organizations have for being um, 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 uh, critical pieces of how people get encultured. Um, they could take on that role, uh, you know, a role that may have been played by families or religious institutions in the past. So that's a piece of the opportunity. I think a piece of the potential transformation as we look forward to ways of reorganizing um, society. It's interesting because Braver Angels is trying to bridge cultural political divides. <clears throat> and if they could settle into being sort of regular communities doing work together, we could, they could then face outward and look at the different problems that are, that are in front of us and collaborate very nicely. I think that, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the opportunities at hand that not enough places are following up on is how to get through into funk, high functioning communities that go take on big tasks. Um, and it's just, we're in this very strange place. So thanks. Uh, one quick yeah. note, um, you know, I've been trying to get uh, a Ken Homer and structured conversations and basically a kind of, you know, how do we all kind of coalesce in, in friendship? And, you know, uh, you know, here we are at work, but boy, this could be so much, so much more rich um, relationship. And uh one of uh, my coworkers goes, we don't need that. We're, we're already good enough. <laughs> I probably am repeating myself, I think. But uh, anyway, it's just, I, I keep on getting back to that. Um, okay. I, I have to listen to this and, uh, and disagree somehow without uh, trying to manipulate, um, you know, my own, uh, uh, you know, wish to experiment. It was a, there was a great pop song a couple of years ago, and the, the essential lyric was that you know somebody was falling in love, as so many pop songs are. I didn't know I needed this as much as I needed it un, until I, I had a little bit of a taste of it, and and that's what the experience is. I think when when people come together and start to have those kind of real richer, deeper conversations. <clears throat> agreed. Agreed. Um, Kevin, do you have to bounce to the top of the hour? Uh, no, I don't. Not, okay, not good. I, I was going to, so I will keep you where you are in the mental queue I've got. So let's go Michael, Ingrid, Eric, Kevin. Thanks. Hi, all. Um, this is really rich. Um, I, I'm, I'm connecting um, some stuff in my, in my everyday life with um, some things that are coming up and have come up here. Um, and not so much today, but, but in some of the things that Gil, you've been talking about um, regarding your recent project and, and, uh, and um, also that, uh, that um, Kevin's been talking about, 
Um, and I'm the, the, the practical on the ground piece is that um, an opportunity um, to take on a dis distressed 19th century industrial property upstate near a train station has, has come up. I was hoping you were going to say it was a 19th century distressed industrialist, but still go ahead. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> well, there's there's a there's a a late 19th century distressed industrialist's family involved. And you know, it it it's sort of a situation that I'm decoding as I go and doing some like fascinating searches and piecing together from like yellowed bits of um, unopened mail on the floor of this space, who people were and how they fit into the picture, um, sort of creating from an analog uh, legacy, a, a bit of a digital, um, a digital, a legacy of digital artifacts and then using you know, the, the usual contemporary methods to track down, okay, so the person who, um, who used to own this space, who does own this space, somebody inherited it, it's a half interest of it. Oh, it looks like there were two sons. One of them sold their interest to a local blah, 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 blah. Um, what's, what's their relationship to their father who it's an old machine shop that's full of old equipment. Um, they're asking more money for it than it's worth. So I'm trying to think of, and this is, you know, where it intersects with, with what I've been doing. There's a lot that I've done in my past of taking old brands and old things that have like become your father's Oldsmobile to, to use the, the classic marketing um, approach and, and think about, you know, what they could be today. And in many cases, commercially, that's about um, a, a kind of modernization and, and revamp that's like, you know, oh, let's make it hip. Um, but I think there's there's so much in figuring out how to um, unearth the legacy that companies have, that institutions have, that and and pull what's good in it. Um, excite the people who have generation generationally in 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 many times you know in many situations and i know you know gil in in your um uh endeavors and and others i've seen where you're looking at um businesses that have been run by somebody who's you know past retirement age has no heir you know looking to what can be done? Can this be co-opt to the workers? Can this somehow benefit, continue to benefit its community in ways it has and perhaps in new ways? Um, you know, this, this is a, a space that is um, a potential event space, a potential performance space, uh, a bit of a gateway to a uh, small town area, a place that has great indigenous culture. There's, you know, opportunity for um, exhibits of artifacts that, you know, um, harken back. And it's, it's, it's really exciting me. Um, and, and, you know, making me think about all the ways that one can can dust off artifacts, both physical and digital, um, give them value um, and and visibility um, 
to contemporary people who would otherwise never have benefited from them. Um, and, you know, then there's this practical opportunity of restoring something, greening it, making it work for the community it's in, both the physical ones it's in and others, you know, contiguous that it might serve and make it financially self-sustaining. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I throw that out there <laughs> just as, as what's up with me and, and, you know, curious about what it provokes with people. Um, you know, I, I, I do think there's, there are so many generational assets, both physical and commercial and gathered wisdom that are lying fallow and destined to go to waste or be buried um, if we don't figure out ways to sustain them and, and celebrate them. Sounds like a beautiful opportunity. Just uh, you're reminding me of times in my life when I was staring at things that might have been huge projects, but might have been super interesting payoffs like that. Um, Eric. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, there are museums and uh, libraries that are trying to collect artifacts like that. I'm involved with vintage computers and uh, it's fascinating when you go back and you see the old mainframes and minis and uh, various people have communities that collect these things and preserve them. So I wish you all the best with that. <laughs> Um, so Eric, I'm so glad you just said that. I've, I've been, we've been opening up a lot of boxes that were in storage and I opened up my time capsule from back mm -hmm. in the day when I was a tech analyst. And I've got two Metrocom modems, three Palm Pilots, mm -hmm. uh, Rex, a little Rex card sort of uh, computer. Yeah, I recently uh, saw Newton. My radio, I've got a Newton, I've got a, <laughs> a one laptop per child, I've got a, a bunch of different things and i'm wondering who would like them like is it should, can i donate them someplace is there uh, search for vintage computer federation and there's probably a local chapter uh there's probably a northwest chapter you could get in touch with people who could help you sweet mm -hmm. um thank you i will do sure. that okay thanks uh, anyone else with thoughts on go ahead mark um i have a lot of friends who are futurists living here in san francisco um it's uh there's different futurists in uh, San Jose, um, more extropians and uh, um, uh, other wacky kinds of uh, um, really kind of discarding the past. Um, and uh, a the futurist friend um, uh, asked me if, uh, because I have a nice garden and a, a nice little cottage, if he could have his futurist gathering at my house. And I uh, accepted. And um, I, in conversations with the people, I, just, I found that I was a pastist. And um, <laughs> I think I've coined that term. Um, but uh, I, again, thinking yesterday after this conversation at the bookstore, um, you know, there's just so much um, that people have done um, that, you know, advances so far above, you know, where we are culturally at, at different times. And, and, and of course, very few people, you know, um, 300 ancient Athenians out of 600,000, you know, a million. Um, but fortunately, we've uh, got, you know, bits of Aristotle and Plato and uh, Sophocles. Um, and, you know, they're as good as anything that's being done today. And I just don't know how to um, you know, deal with that huge um, uh, surplus of the past um, to, you know, have an education um, which should not be so much force feeding the best of the past, but somehow stimulating curiosity. Um, and it sounds, Michael, like you're, uh, you're following your muse in uh, your curiosity. Good to hear. Love that. Stuart. 
Yeah, I just immediately thought of um, the Hornet in Alameda, which is a World War II uh, aircraft carrier. I'm sure a number of people here have been on it. But I mean, stepping onto that, it just puts me right into a meditational space, uh, 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 thinking back and, and, and feeling yourself in that era are wonderful. So yeah, Michael, um, kudos. Mm -hmm. A quick note, um, I forget um, what era the actual Hornet in Alameda is, but the World War II Hornet was sunk. And um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a follow on aircraft carrier. I think that was jet capable, um, the one in Alameda. I don't actually think that it is a World War II vintage, but it might be. USS um, Hornet Sea Air and Space Museum, uh, aircraft carrier, which, uh, so they picked up the NASA Apollo uh, capsule. So yeah, it's post World War II. It's an SX class aircraft carrier completed in late 43. Um, but I think it was named after the Hornet from that was sunk. Um, yeah. yeah, so it is it is World War II um, vintage. Decommissioned um, in 1970. My mistake. What did we do before the inner tubes? <laughs> um, uh, so let's go back to our queue. We have uh, Ingrid, Eric, Kevin. Grace, nice to see you. Hey, it's always interesting to come and uh, get all kinds of tidbits. We started with... Uh, Elon Musk and moved to, I don't even know what, and then got to where we could take our computers. So always interesting. Thanks for that. Uh, so I haven't been here in a while, uh, but it's uh, interesting times right now. Um, I would say that I, when we are talking about Elon Musk, something I want to add is he also said, there's no other country that I could do what I'm doing in. And I think having lived over here now in, in Europe, that there, is, there are certain constraints that of society that he doesn't have to pay attention to when he's in America as an entrepreneur and as a individual. So I think there's a more freedom. And then on the other side of that, I would say what's what I find interesting now is that with um, the war going on and, uh, and, and the direct really threat to Europe in a lot of ways, if it's not actual war, it's certainly an energy war, is that um, you see how the collective works here. So we've never been more united than right now when we're being threatened. Suddenly, I don't know how long this will last, of course, but right now everyone's getting together and we're taking in the refugees and um, building all kinds of pipelines for them and then, and then rejecting the pipeline from Russia and uh, having all kinds of convenings on how we will um, work in, in this new world where we, we aren't reliant on Russia anymore. And then uh, at, in the meantime, I'm hearing these things in America, how the prices of gas has gone up there, yet only what 2% comes from Russia. So opportunism abounds in America. Whereas in Europe, we're sitting here going, the shit has hit the fan in every way. We're some, you know, this, madman is there bringing millions onto our shores that we are taking care of in 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 something that really um after the pandemic and all that i saw people doing to each other and uh, not caring about each other has really renewed my faith in humanity and the european experiment because i'd actually like to say that the eu is an experiment as is america um, it's ongoing. And what's interesting is listening to um, Doug, who's not here anymore, I guess, talk about, um, you know, what are we going to do with energy? We need to go back to agrarian farming and small collectives and, and backwards. Um, I think that ship has sailed long ago. I think that we have to uh, look at um, a completely new way of doing things that doesn't involve, um, you know, um, telling everyone in the world that we are suddenly going to go back to the farm. That simply will never work. We have way beyond that at this point. However, there is elements that we could bring from that. But I, I just it's such a far ranging conversation. It's just so interesting every time to hear the American agenda when I get on this and I miss that. And so I, I wanted to join again, especially find out what was going on right now with your thoughts, because I feel like the EU 
is, and I'm on the side where I'm incredibly hopeful. I, I am, I literally am getting test, uh, texts every day and calls from Ukrainian refugees trapped in their homes, asking me if I can help because I subscribed to a bunch of lists to home some refugees. And now it's suddenly I'm, I'm weirdly getting this front row view and I'll get off the phone crying because it's devastating to hear someone who can't leave their city and I can't help. Um, this is a strange phenomenon. And yet on the other side, incredibly hopeful watching the EU come together and say, F you Russia, Germany saying the pipeline, shove it. Who knows if this will last, but for now, it makes me feel like maybe this little experiment will do something really amazing for green energy because we already have a pact, a social pact as, as, a, as the EU to do this. And this is accelerating it, just like the pandemic accelerated our digital jump to the future. Um, you know, at Germany's not using fax machines as much anymore. Okay, so I, I feel really weirdly hopeful and at the other side, incredibly distraught by what's happening for the human experience. So um, that's sort of, yeah, my take on things right now. <laughs> wow, wow, Ingrid. Um, before I go to Klaus, would you mind just telling us a, a, a little bit more, a story or two about your experiences with talking to people trapped in Ukraine or whatever else, just like, what's it been like? Well, you know, it's been really interesting. I have, um, yeah, my name got out there. So I've heard from someone in Kharkiv a, a couple of days ago saying, is it true you help refugees? And I was, I was like, what are you talking about? But I have lists of things I can sell, send them. I have, um, there are all kinds of um, uh, uh, airlines are, are um, offering uh, flights. If you can get out um, of your city, free flights. I, I can tell them how they get free tickets once they get to Europe. Wow. Um, I, I had friends in Warsaw with a family in Lviv that I was talking to, telling me, and I barely know them. If they come to Warsaw, we will house them. I don't know this family in Lviv every, but I'm checking in with them every day. And, and it's a, it's a really tough position because, um, yeah, there's nothing I can say except, um, try and tell them what I know, and if they if they get to Amsterdam, then uh, our doors are open, and we're putting them in hotels. Where um, every people are coming together, putting them in their houses, giving them jobs. And look, there's the whole thing about well, we didn't do this with the Syrians, but this is a weirdly different situation in some ways. So it's very complicated. It's just complicated. It is. Yeah. And you're totally right. Thank you for bringing that up as well. Thank you. Um, it's really moving what you're doing. Um, Klaus? Yeah, I wanted to uh, respond, Ingrid, to, to this decentralization uh, uh, thought. You know, I've been on the advisory council for the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and the outcome from last year was uh, embracing what they call the farm to fork community food systems. And the reason for that is that the centralization of food, globalization of food systems has destroyed uh, the communities. Um, so when you go through Europe, you have a small butcher, baker in every town, uh, quite self-sufficient, has been evolving over hundreds, thousands of generations to be that way. Um, and in order to return uh, soil back to health and nature back to health, restore biodiversity is a hugely local issue because soil is different, first of all, in each place. Um, climate, access to water, socioeconomics, so all play a role. So to, to say we have to go back to medieval practices of agriculture is also not right. right? So there has to be uh, a new approach to where we can allow a rapid decentralization that is well managed, well orchestrated with, with uh, macro level support structures. So I used to work as a corporate strategist for Metro Cash and Carry. You may be familiar with them. It's the largest food wholesaler in Europe and in the world, really. 
And that was our mission, you know, to maintain small businesses and, and keep them alive. You know, so particularly in Eastern Europe at the time, I was actually working in, in Russia also, which was our largest uh, uh, client so, uh, country. So the, the, the idea to, to decentralize then allows people to, to um, integrate a farm to fork food system, meaning you start with the farmer, but then you also build the supply chain, the processor, the logistics, you know, the aggregator and so on that moves the product into, into, onto the uh, uh, shelves in the, in the grocery store. So that's the idea. And, and, and that really needs to be professionalized, accelerated, you know, and, and it does require the support of companies uh, who are in many ways sourcing multinational. I mean, here in the US, we're sourcing tomatoes for Mexico. You know, it, it's just that the whole system is just uh, in, in need of, of uh, repair, of uh, reworking. So I just wanted to, to respond to decentralization doesn't mean going back to the Middle Ages. It means to go back to the future uh, with, new, with new supporting processes and, and a vigorous support of the entire population who needs to understand why that is so important. Well, I would agree. I was saying Europe, that probably has the most chance because we do support the small farmers. It's important for us to have that relationship. And we have an EU system that also encourages and protects that. Um, but it, it does have to be professionalized. I think there, I think that there is more support here, probably for something like that. Yeah, it's it's interesting how these things manifest in, under different regimes. So in India, they've been having farmer protests for years because they were going to get rid of a minimum price subsidy. This is my amateur understanding from the outside, but they were they were legislating away a minimum price subsidy that was sort of guaranteeing a price for farmers in India. And they were going to let the farm basically throw the farmers into the free market. And I think most of us know that free markets pretend to be free markets, but really, really often they're not. And so you're at the at the mercy of whoever. Like when the railroads go out across the American West and promise everybody 40 acres and a mule and whatever else, they don't tell them that, you know, actually this land is barely arable at all. It's mostly good for grazing. And oh, by the way, when you if you do manage to raise a crop, we're going to be your only buyer because you need to get your crop to market. So we're going to set prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this plays out all across the world. You, you, like it's no fun being a small farmer kind of any place on earth, except for the places that have begun to realize that these are the treasures of the future. Um, so uh, Grace. question and I'm hoping maybe Klaus has has some answers to it. Um, I'm in Slovenia and a, a farm goes out of business every week. And so this idea that um, both of you have expressed that Europe does support the farmers, I don't see it. What I see is, you know, the large companies putting farmers in debt. I see like tremendous farming of corn here, which we don't eat here. And my friends who've talked to farmers have said, yeah, the farmers have to do what the EU is doing. And, and I can just see the deterioration of our soil even over the, the five years I've been here. And so I don't see on the ground what would look like support of the EU for what Klaus is saying um, is necessary and for what Ingrid pointed to is, you know, we do support our farmers. Yeah, we, we love our farmers and there's a very strong connection to land here. It's that this is a fairly new country, right? It's fairly new in the EU, so we still have a lot of cultural cohesion. But I'm seeing that really horribly eroded just every week. So I, I'd love it if you guys can provide any information because I don't have any information yeah. about it. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, it, it requires um, a, a significant reconfiguration. I mean, we just uh, published uh, this. We're doing um, the next webinar uh, focused on funding the 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 uh, the transition. And, and so, what the, the what the difficulty that the farmer has is that in order to change their processes, they will first of all need money upfront to invest different types of equipment, different uh, processes, loss of market share, loss of yields, and so on. Um, 
so and and they need to have design support because you need to really be farm specific in in uh, helping the farmer to shift into the just perfect type of seed and crop type and so on. You know, integration of livestock and what have you. Um, but then in the investment community, the worst thing we can do is have the federal government throw billions of dollars into the industry without a plan, right? Hoping that this is somehow going to work out because it's not. I mean, historically, it's just not. So there has to be a process structure in place where the farmer commits to a series of steps to implement, meaning I'm going to buy uh, fences, I'm going to buy different equipment, I'm going to put in cover seeds, I'm going to rotate my crops, I put livestock on it, so on and so on, that uh, um, requires upfront funding, but that also needs to be monitored. So you start with a plan, uh, you tokenize that plan, you bring money to the front end for the farmer, maybe 20% of the entire value is paid out up front. At the end of one year, there is a verification process, meaning you get audited to see if you are on track with your plan. And then as you move forward, you end up in a certification process. And upon achieving certification, you get you know, the rest of the money, 25% or so, it takes three to five years. So to create, we need to create a, structure you know that allows the investment community to fund a process to fund 10,000 farms at the same time right to to create a massive uh, uh, shift in in how this uh, how the farmer can engage then the next step of course is now need the supply chain needs to come in because they now need to decentralize their sourcing strategies, their aggregation strategies, because now you're dealing with a decentralized supply chain, I mean, a, a producer chain. So it's, it, it, is, it is an incredibly um, uh, complex undertaking and it requires the collaboration of a lot of people. But at this point in time, the finance community is first of all uninformed. They are, they're investing money in places where it does more harm than good. I mean, think about impossible foods and all this you know, insanity, but what is happening. So they're investing in the wrong places. So they're, they're shifting the system into, into the wrong direction. Uh, so to, to this webinar that we are doing here, we, we, we want to bring attention to the investment community saying here is, here is what we need to do and here's how we recommend doing it. And there's some, we have some uh, good panel speakers on there who, who are completely focused on funding this transition, but uh, also need the intellectual foundation or the theoretical foundation to underpin there. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Thanks, Klaus. Just one more quick question is, Go ahead, Chris. Um, what kind of consideration is being given to indigenous knowledge? I mean, I know that sounds funny because we're white, but you know, Doesn't sound here, funny. Yeah, some people here didn't have running water until 40 years ago. So the people are still alive who have the indigenous knowledge. Like, is that something to be considered, Klaus? Yeah, I mean, when you think about what is regenerative agriculture, it's basically indigenous knowledge. Yeah, you know? and indigenous knowledge is that you have to treat the soil like a living thing. Understanding that the soil microbiome is the foundation of all life on land, right? Because out of the soil microbiome, uh, the microorganisms living in there elevate up you know, into insects and worms, which elevate into birds and mammals and so on and so on. So every all of life on land originates in the soil microbiome, which we are destroying with these chemicals that we're putting onto the soil. The soil microbiome in turn is reflected in our gut microbiome. So indigenous people know that. Indigenous cuisines know that, whether that's Korean or Japanese or German, you know, these, these cuisines have evolved over thousands of years to keep us healthy and to create a balance between the soil and, and our own personal needs. The Asian, uh, uh, actually all of these old cultures, you know, are obsessed with, with using food as medicine. Whenever they get sick, you know, the first thing is, you know, you need to eat uh, a chicken noodle soup you know, in its most basic form. So indigenous knowledge is there. We, we, we have it in, ingrained in us. We just, it's, we don't need to, um, yeah, we don't, we, we, it, it, it's, it sounds uh, more, uh, 
I, I, I don't know how to frame it, but I mean, we, we have it. Let's just say we, we, we are regenerative agriculture is indigenous agriculture. Um, thanks, Klaus. We, um, we're not going to make it through our whole queue. I'll just show everybody what the queue looks like right now. We've been kind of slow going through the, I thought we were moving quickly through us, but we're not moving that quickly through us. And a couple of people came and joined us later in the call, which is awesome. Uh, so let's just do a few people. Let's go, Eric, Kevin, Rob. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for sharing and giving us the perspective of Europe, what's going on. Um, but let's look at a greater perspective. In 1977, we launched two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, and they've left the solar system. And when they look back at Earth, we are a 12% of a pixel in that picture of the grand solar system. So if more people come to look at what we have here, the blessings of Earth, that's something. And we just launched this web telescope and it's gonna be operating for 10 years and it'll find some amazing things. So that got me thinking, well, where do we find our hope for the next 10 years? Just something to think about in your mind. And now I'm just gonna dump a lot of stuff in the chat. Um, some things I've been working on and thinking about. So I put out a new uh, show today in my video series called Brady Bunch Dimensions. It's about ZZ structure, Ted Nelson's idea, using the Brady Bunch as an example to help people understand it. And then um, there's an app I've been uh, beta testing called Cosmic. I put the links there. And there's a museum that just opened up in New Jersey uh, near where Bell Labs was. So check that out. Um, I can give a very quick demo just to show you what that cosmic is like. If I could just share my screen for a minute. Go for it. Okay. Desktop. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is a Macintosh app and uh, it's an infinite canvas. So you can uh, visualize things that you could browse the web in a window like this. You put sticky notes wherever you want, and then uh, you put in pictures. So like Eric's selfie over here. And then when I change this little sticky note to Eric's Purim costume, <laughs> okay, then this is a live reload that's gonna change. Yeah, Eric's Purim costume. Okay, so then these are universes. So here's a private universe. Here's one I created called the Ides of March because I created it on March 15th. So it's loading my universe and it's just a whole bunch of things that I put together. Some music, some spreadsheets, uh, some sticky notes, and it has the concept of a card. So like you could put things on a card and you can transclude across universes too. So like this card is transcluded from another universe here. And then I could zoom in and look at what's on the card and it has three pieces of music that I digitized and uh, a sticky note of what I'm working on. And then uh, this weekend, I'm gonna be participating in a music digitization project. So I collected what I need to start working on it. So I'm taking this piece from a music notebook from 1912 and I'm going to be notating this music in a digital form so like I have a pro uh, you know, first draft up here and then I was playing around and I can embed a web page that has the wax cylinder recording wow. from 1912 that you can hear here <laughs> okay so Think about the power of this and like, yeah, here's a Creative Commons web page. So it's like bringing together all the tools for a task and like planning a project for the future, just a board of sticky notes that'll come up soon. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, just thinking it through, sticking notes and moving them around. What do I want to do for my demo? Okay, so um, it seems like a possible, a, a, um, it has a lot of potential. Um, and the link's in there if you want to beta test or play with it. Um, Eric, thank you. Uh, well, a brief question. Do intermediate objects in those worlds or universes have high, uh, permalinks? Like that, that little tableau you showed us of the yeah. sheet music and whatever else, could I link directly into that? 
Yeah, that whole card with the three pieces of sheet music, that card could be shared publicly or, um, yeah, so the whole idea of transclusion, you could take pieces from other people's work and use them in your work and collaborate. Um, they're very ambitious. I, I mean, the app right now, it's got a way to go, but uh, I think they're on the right track. And, and this morning, um, this morning on LinkedIn, I got a, an email from a woman at Sprintal, which is a Swedish company doing something that looks a little bit similar. And I will go browse. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I will go browse Cosmic to see sort of differences and all that because I think the space is like jamming right now. There's lots of companies doing note taking plus zoomable whatever. Yeah. Um, and everybody's got a little piece of the puzzle here. And I don't know that many of them are open source. So we can't kind of, uh, you know, mix and munch them together. Yeah, this is a company that will eventually sell it. But if you beta test, you get a year for free. There you go. Cool. Sweet. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing that sure. to our attention. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Robb. Hi. Um, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we were starting to look at uh, donut economics in our watershed, the Swannanoa watershed. And <clears throat> we had the first meeting where we said, oh, you know, there was somebody who keeps our local precinct alive and he's going to look at public sector. And there was somebody who's a permaculture farmer who makes his living with videos done in his backyard, essentially, and classes and stuff. And uh, there was a pastor who's looking to create a community. And Working with him, we've uh, <clears throat> looked at, you know, can we make the faith communities into a, a resilient, connected part of the, the safety net? And then now we're looking at a couple um, businesses that are based on uh, caring about the people in our watershed uh, that are in need and the watershed itself. So we're looking at a home health care franchise. Uh, and it's kind of like church visitation as a business, essentially. And then add on to that uh, weatherization and uh, energy retrofits of those old folks' houses <clears throat> that you know, can be added on as a, as a fee. And um, we're also uh, working on a demo of a group that's created a, a node of a large credit union, the Notre Dame Credit Union, in a parish community so that more affluent members can post their collateral for folks who couldn't buy a $5,000 car to get to work. And you're know, creating a lot of mutuality in there of sharing and no interest, no usury within that. And with those things, uh, I think we can also pretty, once there's that kind of flow, because the home healthcare should make a lot of money, but it, we're charging less than the regular commercial folks. And uh, that can underwrite the weatherization. Uh, you get some subsidies around that, but you really just say to the, to the family members, do you want them to have a lower power bill because you're paying their power bill? And so, you know, weatherization pays, uh, re energy retrofits pay, all those sorts of things, but you have a paying customer who cares more about grandma staying in the house alive and the, the grandparents or whatever. <clears throat> and then the credit union, uh, and the credit union is a place where you can charge fees to. You know, uh, we're looking at, um, yeah, I know the Lyft economy guys, they're great. Uh, the, uh, anyway, we can set up a local currency uh, because we can give it fiat currency every month, you know, through taxing the businesses and from the uh, transactions in the credit union. And so we could do what Sarafi was doing in Kenya around that. And you have lots of local circulation, so things work a lot better, but that's like stage four. But I think, you know, we, but we got a group and last week, this week, actually, we had two environmental folks from the local Warren Wilson, which is a work college here. So they want to get their students engaged. And that's part of what they do is community engagement. And the woman who's in charge of uh, environmental law and ethics was there and the woman who's mentor to the student work group and this is one of these work colleges where like i had a friend who learned how to be a plumber and then he wanted to be in nonprofit management and so he made his living as a plumber on the weekends <laughs> and worked at nonprofit wages during the week uh, with what he loved and so we're getting them engaged and so i think it's you just have to have a place where people care about it, and you can create these resilient you know donut economy circular economy things and, uh, and everybody here, you know, this is a place of, full of underemployed creatives who've moved here for the lifestyle. So everybody needs a little bit of gig economy work. 
they're like your waiter and a light worker, you know, or whatever. Uh, you know, if your waiter or waitress, you know, is not also a healer, then they're probably not going to stay. <laughs> but you don't make money as a, <laughs> you know, the number of people who want your Reiki along with your other stuff. is So this is more gear economy, folks. For folks to care about people and to, and to care about the environment. So this is Swan and Noah uh, watershed near Asheville, uh, 28778. And so anyway, we're, we're seeing how we can knit that together and have these businesses where people can care about the watershed. But the, the lenses of the, uh, of the donut are local, social, and global, and global, uh, are, are local, social, and ecological, and then global, social. And, so we're building, you know, kind of a, uh, a community that loves the watershed and, and wants to, and the businesses can be around caring and building the community together. So it seems like it's working pretty well. It does. Awesome, Kevin. Um, and I, I, I just love hearing all the different, uh, the different projects. Um, and everybody knows you're on the list, so we know how to, how to reach you in these things. So thank you. Um, I think we lost Rob along the way. So let's go Klaus. And then that might actually be the last, uh, last check-in for today. Yeah, I already shared what I'm what I'm working on. So the the, uh, um, the the focus really is on on developing this farm to fork strategy here uh, in the U.S., which has been widely embraced in Europe. In fact, each European country has signed on to this and and made a statement about the importance of it. Here in the U.S., uh, it has been officially rejected, you know, Vilsack went on record into Europe saying we are going to take a different course, uh, which meaning uh, we're staying with commodity crops and, and uh, we're making monocropping more efficient and this precision agriculture and all of that. So that's something with which we, you know, in the uh, regenerative movement don't see uh, happening. Uh, it's not feasible, it's, it's, it's not workable. So we're working to, to find workaround structures that uh, um, create enough pressure in the markets to shift this. So something what Kevin is doing is super helpful uh, to, to empower communities you know, to, to take these things uh, into their own hands. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I feel, I, I, I see a lot of energy uh, streaming into this, uh, but uh, hopefully there is a tipping point where it really starts rolling and, and take on speed because we don't have another three, four, five growing seasons to keep going as we are. You know, the, the, uh, the crop forecast, for example, the winter crop in the US is, is uh, about 15% below normal because the yields are falling. Uh, the adverse weather conditions, weather, the climate-based disruptions are already hitting us. Uh, um, so you combine that with, uh, with, this, with Russia and Croatia uh, being knocked off the markets, it's, it's, it's precipitating catastrophic uh, impacts in the Middle East, in Africa. You know, we, are at, we are really at the precipice of, of uh, some really bad times. Um, we are the, only 11% of the U.S. corn production is actually used for food. You know, the rest yeah. goes into biofuels and feeds. You know? in, Pete, so, in Pete's Plex dispatch that he sent out this morning, the first thing is an illustration of different countries' proportion of their grain output and wh whether it's used for food, for animal food, human food, animal food, fuel, or other. And it's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah. So we need to master the political will you know, to get into this uh, and the political um, landscape in the US is still so divided and, and so, so uh, resistant to all of this, uh, it's getting pretty scary. So sorry, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to say everybody lives in a watershed where you can make a difference and you can, you can worry about the world or you can do something locally in your exactly. watershed to make a difference if you get folks together. So, you know, you can be gloomy about the world, or you can do something local, it's up, it's up to you. And I think totally. it's knowing what to do that matters that will make a difference is important in, in, yeah. in that choice. Well, I'll just respond with, with the donut thing. We look at those four lenses and we do a local portrait. You know, we have somebody who 
knows the garden scene and somebody who knows the uh, the forestry forest service stuff i mean you know you just you can look around people want to get together people everybody's concerned thanks uh julian you'll have the last word yeah, uh, so what klaus has been uh, making comments about and other people i'm wondering if there's a way how would somebody a lay person know when bad soil practices are in place without attending a seminar you know day-long seminar or week-long seminar to learn how to evaluate this stuff, if there was some way to more quickly deliver that message in, in the way that a lay person could understand and start to communicate the urgency. What we found uh, as the most compelling message, and this is uh, being developed by the uh, Micronutrient Association uh, right now, is the link between the quality of the soil microbiome and the nutrient density of food. And they're actually working on a handheld device where you can take a leaf of lettuce in there and it shows you the nutrient quality inside the food. And so by, by explaining to, uh, to mothers right, that the, uh, the nutrient quality of the food that you buy determines the well-being of your child and, and, and uh, the, the, the development of your child in a healthy way, we found this to be the most powerful message. And, uh, there, is, there is a lot of energy and work to advance this and, and share that with the population. Is this device going to be affordable? Yeah, oh yeah, it's it's already, in fact, I, I'm sorry, we're too late, otherwise I would dig up the website. I'm going to put the website on the OGM uh, 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 distribution so you can see how that is advancing already. Sounds great, thank you. Um, thanks, Julian. And then uh, two things, uh, one, um, after Fukushima, there was a movement that created an open Geiger project for Geiger counters, and they tried to get like inexpensive Geiger counters in the hands of lots of people in Japan. Um, and I, I, I will, I will put forth again my total amateur version of that for this problem, which is, um, why don't we do the same for soil organic meters, basically measuring soil fertility. And then there's lots of other ways of measuring soil fertility. I'm sure that satellite photographs do a good job, et cetera, et cetera. But let's get, and then, and then why don't we propose a tax so that anybody who's improving soil fertility actually gets a rebate, they get a negative tax. And anybody who is hurting soil fertility gets a punitive tax uh, that might actually steer them away from industrial farming, et cetera, et cetera. So that anybody who's caring for the ground and making the soil fertile does better. Because uh, right now the incentives are all ass backwards. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, so Stacy, maybe you get the last word. Yeah, I just want to say one thing that I think really should be brought into this conversation, and that's um, the information that's out there on the role of global mental health and the connection with nutrients in the soil. Agreed. Thank you. Um, so I, I sent a note out about... Um, brainstorming for marketing pictures brain tomorrow if any of you would like to join i would love that i'm trying to figure that out and uh with that thanks to everybody this has been really rich as it always is it's always like full of nutrients <laughs> micronutrients and macronutrients and all that kind of thing but I, thanks I, everybody. I found the link i found the link to the oh good uh, bio, uh, so it's in there perfect thank you bionutrient.org yeah thank, thank you right. so much thanks mm. Um, and uh, remember, we need a topic for next week. So on the Mattermost chat, if you want to brainstorm topics for our, our, our call next week, please do. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.